Hello, everyone. I know some of you are still arriving, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome all of you to the uh, High Meadows Environmental Institute faculty seminar series. My name is Mike Celia. I'm the director of uh, Princeton's High Meadows Environmental Institute. And as always, it's a pleasure to have all of you back with us again today. Uh, this is the last of our monthly seminars for this semester. Uh, the series will begin again in the fall, uh, beginning with uh, the first seminar being in September. As uh, you probably all know, the series features prominent Princeton faculty. Uh, and today we have uh, the pleasure to hear from one of the uh, 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 most recent faculty hires in our institute, uh, Professor Reed Maxwell. I'll remind you that uh, as we have been doing since we went remote, uh, we invite uh, all of the audience members to submit questions or comments using the Q&A box. So simply click on it, uh, type in your question or comment, and uh, we will receive it here. Uh, and that will then be um, um, coordinated uh, at the end of the talk. Also, please note that the chat function is disabled for attendees, so you need to use the Q&A. Uh, and as a reminder, the lecture is being recorded. Uh, as I said, today's speaker is Reed Maxwell, with our discussant being uh, Professor Emilcare Porporato. I'll say a few words about Emilcare when I introduce him uh, after Reed's talk. Uh, Reed is, uh, as I said, a, 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 a professor here at Princeton. He is appointed jointly between the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Princeton's High Meadows Environmental Institute. He's also the director of the Integrated Groundwater Modeling Center, uh, something he's directed now for, for quite a while. Reed is a, is a, a, a world-renowned hydrologist whose research focuses on connections in the hydrologic cycle uh, with emphasis on the groundwater component as well as evapotranspiration and snow, among others. He is a leader in high-performance computing and its application in hydrology. Uh, his early work was really groundbreaking in terms of high performance computing applied to groundwater systems. And he has since expanded that uh, to other components of the hydrologic system and also combines uh, this really outstanding uh, computational science with field observations and with remote sensing data and information. <clears throat> I'll also note that Reed has a a strong and, and very active outreach program focused on water in general and uh, uh, oftentimes groundwater more specifically. Reed has been recognized with a number of awards. Uh, I'll mention just a few of his recent awards. Last year, 2020, he was the Darcy Distinguished Lecturer for the National Groundwater Association. He was the 2018 Boussinesque Lecturer, and he held the Bell Van Zulen Visiting Chair at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And he was recently also elected a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, Reed has been a fantastic addition to our institute as well as to the CEE department. And I invite all of you to join me in giving uh, a very big virtual welcome uh, to our great friend, uh, Reed Maxwell. Reed, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a, a really kind uh, introduction. And um, it, it took me almost my entire sabbatical, uh, but the, I believe the pronunciation is uh, Belafon Silen, which literally means uh, Lady of the Castle. So it's pretty uh, crazy endowed chair, um, but awesome to have for a sabbatical. So thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry we're doing this remotely, but I appreciate that everybody is is here and attending and and hopefully participating. I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to for interaction. So I'm going to talk about better understanding of water availability in the U.S. through community tools. And um, before I get started, wake everybody up. We're going to do a quick poll. And if you can either shoot the QR code, uh, I think Morgan put can put the link in the chat. The link is also here. I don't expect you to type it. Morgan can put it into the chat for everybody. So you'll get a Mentimeter screen like this. Um, thanks to the McGraw Center for, for setting up our site license with Mentimeter. And 
you'll be able to answer a poll. What is the largest surface water reservoir in the US? And we'll see if there's any Great Lakes. Awesome answer, lots of water. There's a little note about what we define as surface water reservoir. Crater Lake, oh, good one. Lake Superior, Hoover, close. Lake Powell, super close. Awesome, people are waking up. Lake Huron. And I see it getting larger and larger as the audience hones in on the correct answer. So we got about half. So the correct answer is in fact, is in fact, if I can make this go forward, is in fact Lake Mead. So Lake Mead is the largest surface water reservoir in the US. Surface water reservoirs have to be human created. Um, they have to be artificial. Great Lakes, lots of water, obviously, um, but they don't quite uh, count as the largest surface water reservoir. Of course, backed up behind Hoover Dam. This is Lake Mead in happier times. This is a obviously satellite photo. This is from 2000. Lake Mead supplies water for, to about 20 million people. Now, what many people are not aware of is this is Lake Mead kind of more currently. Uh, the Western US is in severe drought and only 10 feet of lake level stand between historic water cuts to three states. And this could happen as early as June of this year. Now, as far as the cheat sheet, the dam height, so Hoover Dam is, is 224 meters or 726 uh, feet high. And what that means is that 10 feet is pretty small compared to this. Now, if we think about it, reservoirs are not just rivers, right? 96% of Lake Mead supply depends on the Rocky Mountain headwaters. And in fact, a lot of people chose Lake Powell. Lake Powell is actually the second largest reservoir in the US and that feeds almost directly into Lake Mead. Now, warmer temperatures, climate change, changes in snowmelt timing are really wreaking havoc on the amount of water that plants use and also our inflows. Now, just to give you a quick cheat sheet in terms of terminology, Lake Mead's about 35 cubic kilometers or 25 million acre feet. Now, those of us that are not super familiar with an acre foot, it's one acre filled a foot deep and it's typically thought about to be water to supply a suburban household for about a year. Now, other lakes have had very similar challenges, right? So we could jump to Lake Oroville in California. It's just one of the, um, this, this upstream of, uh, this is upstream of um, the California Central Valley. And if we look at Lake Oroville in 2014 over the historic drought, and we look at Lake Oroville as of last week, um, we see that lake levels are also pretty low in our reservoirs in the Sierra Nevada and California. Now what's important is in between 2017 was when if Lake Oroville so flooded so badly, it actually blew out the spillway and the dam. And so extremes have become really this kind of new normal. Now I want us to think about not just surface water reservoirs, but now what is the largest reservoir of water, of fresh water in the US. So we'll switch the poll. So what's the largest freshwater reservoir in the US? The audience is zooming in on this pretty quickly. Oh, we've got snow. 
Rocky Mountains, Sierra Nevada, super important. And in fact, snow is one of these large important reservoirs, but it's not the largest. The largest freshwater reservoir in the US is in fact, groundwater. Groundwater is our largest freshwater reservoir. It's 99% of our world's unfrozen freshwater. So it's the largest accessible freshwater source on the world. It's half of our drinking water in the US and 60% of the world's agriculture. Now groundwater is being depleted at an alarming rate. It's hard to see and you know, really kind of out of sight, out of mind. So if we jump back to the California historic drought and we think about you know, how that drought must have wreaked havoc on agricultural revenues, turns out in fact, even during the historic drought in California Central Valley, agricultural revenues remained high. This is some really great work out of the Pacific Institute. All you need to pay attention to is this is through the drought, historic drought years. And what we see is that total revenues of agriculture actually more or less peaked. Now, why is this? The reason for this is that groundwater pumping made up much of this water deficit. And I'm showing, this is some work uh, by a recent PhD student, uh, Dr. Lauren Thatch. This was published in Groundwater last year. And I'm showing a lot of things. Uh, this is California Central Valley. This is actually the San Joaquin, one of the major watersheds with, within the Central Valley. And I'm showing a product, remote sensing product called GRACE here. GRACE is a pair of satellites that from small changes in position of the two satellites, you can infer changes in the Earth's gravity vector. From changes in Earth's gravity vector, one of the largest components is actually changes in terrestrial water storage. So changes in terrestrial water storage can be large enough that they can show up in microgravity or changes in Earth's gravity, and they can be detected from space. Now, these are laid over, over top with some integrated hydrologic model simulations to which Mike alluded to earlier that, that Dr. Thatch ran for her, um, this is actually for a paper that was published in Groundwater um, as part of her master's thesis. And what we see is that we get some fidelity between our baseline irrigation and pumping cases. And so what this led Lauren to do was to actually merge so she could fuse remote sensing and a large number of these computer, computer simulations to actually estimate how much groundwater was pumped from the California Central Valley. So using GRACE as an overall depletion and then fitting hundreds of thousands of model simulations, large scale integrated hydrologic model simulations for a non-drought 2010 and drought year 2014, Lauren could come up with estimates of how much water was depleted. Now what we see is we get about 26, 27 cubic kilometers of water pumped out during that single drought year. Now that's actually, if we think about one cubic kilometers, 810,000 acre feet, right? And the average flow of the Colorado is about 14 million acre feet. Farmers in the San Joaquin may have pumped 1.5 times the Colorado River flow in 2014 to sustain agriculture during the drought. And our use of groundwater is really a national issue. This is some work that one of my colleagues and, and collaborators, Professor Laura Condon, who's at the University of Arizona in hydrologic and atmospheric sciences. And what Laura was interested in was sort of large scale, how does this depletion in groundwater impact the rest of the hydrologic cycle? This was work that was published in Science Advances and this is an image from that work where we ran before and after simulations, sort of pre-development and post-industrial or post-depletion. And what's colored here are streams by size, by flow, and colored by depletion. And so we see areas here like High Plains Aquifer where we have complete stream depletion, but then we can zoom in. And if we look at groundwater pumping in the upper Colorado, we actually have up to 50% reductions in flow because of groundwater depletion. And an area you wouldn't think about being important for groundwater depletion. 
And what's important about this is that this may also account for a reduction in flow. So it's really this holistic system. Now, as I said, this is a national issue. If you look across this map, everywhere is impacted by groundwater pumping. And in fact, everywhere is also impacted by climate change. Now, one of the interesting to me impacts of climate change is migration of the so-called 100th meridian. And that 100th meridian has classically been used to sort of separate our arid and more humid components of the country. And some really nice work by Seeger et al, which was published in Earth Interactions in 2018, this is an animation that came out of Yale 360, shows that our definition of the 100th meridian has migrated. And in fact, climate change is exporting our West's water problems or the West water problems eastward. And some of our own work has shown this too. This is also work that was led by Laura Condon at University of Arizona um, in collaboration with Adam Ashley, who's staff at, at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And we published this work in Nature Communications last year. And we ran large scale climate perturbation. So increases in temperature, one and a half, two and 40 degree changes in temperature over the continental US. And we looked at changes in the entire hydrologic cycle. And one of the really interesting findings of this was that our warming is actually more sensitive in our more humid basin. So I'm coloring our watersheds across the major watersheds across the US by aridity. So our more humid in the east. And then I'm looking at the change or the ET sensitivity change per degree versus degree in warming. And so our more humid basins have a much more sensitive, much more vulnerable uh, behavior to warming than our more arid basins. And ET turns out is most sensitive to warming in the Eastern US where our water tables are generally more shallow. Now, we can also look at how much water is depleted by warming or might be depleted by warming because of groundwater. And we see these widespread lowering of water tables. This is depletion in our one and a half, two and four degree case. We see again that this is born mostly in our Eastern US. And we see these, you know, kind of widespread lowering of water table, but even our modest warming scenarios are up to 119 million cubic meters, right? Four Lake Powell's a huge amount of water or one quarter of a Lake Erie. And if, just as our cheat sheet, Lake Powell, as I mentioned, is 30 um, kilometers squared when full or about 24 million acre feet. And our four degree warming case is roughly 10 Lake Powell's. So we see these huge looming water issues nationwide. So what do we do? Are we all gonna turn to groundwater as our savior for our water needs? Well, this is where I talk about kind of this new, the new normal or no analog future, meaning we're off our past roadmap. And just two quick examples. This is a recent story that was in NPR on how Louisiana is running dangerously short of groundwater. You normally think Louisiana is important for flooding. And then just today, NOAA renormalized their 30 year climate normals. And we can see that over most of the US, we've had roughly a degree of change since the turn of the last century. So what do we do? Well, high performance computing is great. As Mike mentioned, we can do you know, all of these incredible simulations, but there are huge barriers to entry. Not everybody has the access to these simulations. And again, if we think about one year of our CONUS simulation is half a million CPU hours, the CONUS pumping and climate simulations that I showed were 12 million CPU hours. And Lauren Central Valley simulations were just greater than 1 million CPU hours. This is a huge amount of computer time. And we can really understand and learn from these systems, but this isn't accessible to everybody. This is something that is not widely available. Now we also have a huge data challenge as well, right? We have huge storage needs. One year of the CONUS, not only is it 500,000 core hours, but it's three terabytes of input and 13 terabytes of total output. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is how can community and machine learning approaches help, right? We face, face significant challenges, but we wanna think about how we move forward and what our, what our pathway is to really kind of empower the broader community to have access to these kinds of tools and techniques. 
Our groundwater observations are sparse. Our observations of the past don't reflect the future. And our systems are really complicated and interconnected. And I maintain that we need to put these decisions, these computational tools in the hands of those making decisions. So I'm gonna highlight two projects that I'm fortunate enough to be part of. One is called HydroFrame, the other is called HydroGen. And HydroFrame is focused on reducing technical barriers of entry for really bringing physically based modeling to a broad community. Now HydroGen, which is led by PI Laura Condon, uh, again, as I mentioned at the University of Arizona, and HydroGen is about using machine learning approaches to train emulators on integrated hydrologic models to really put groundwater data and simulations into water managers' hands. Now I'm gonna talk first briefly about HydroFrame. HydroFrame, you can look up hydroframe.org. There's a lot of information. You can kind of walk through the app. And what HydroFrame does is it leverages computer science to transform simulations and data-driven data discovery. Now, it allows us to conduct these sort of large scale simulations, but also put them in ways that we remove computational barriers to the access of that information or to allowing users to automatically run large scale simulations. And we're also developing, as Mike mentioned, K-12 education outreach modules. I'm not going to talk about K-12 education outreach in this talk. It's actually one of the few talks in a while that I haven't, but know that that's a big part of this. So what might you do if you, you know, log into HydroFrame? So what you can do is you, you go through the Kwasi subsetter, you can choose a watershed in the US, and then what the system does is it automatically loads and runs a Parflow CONUS subset run and runs it in the cloud or on containers with a whole range of different options. And so this is an example on Princeton hardware. So now you launch a job on our hardware, it automatically runs the Parflow CONUS, in a container with a whole suite of options. And then the user gets results that they can interact with in this particular case. And they can navigate the results, they can save the results, they can re-download them. And so what this does is this actually democratizes the ability to run these types of simulations. And all of this is running now on the, on the Princeton Hydro Data Center, which is a three petabyte custom storage compute environment that was built specifically for this project. And so it's this mixture of large data and compute and software interfaces that we can use to sort of seamlessly run these kinds of simulations and then dive into the results in a very user-friendly way that's not just user stories of hydrology, but that's user stories across anybody that might be interested in hydrologic data. Now, the second project I'm gonna talk about is hydrogen. And hydrogen is a physically real rigorous machine learning platform for hydrologic scenario generation in this no analog future. And I'll talk a little bit more about what this is. Now, Hydrogen is a really interesting and different project. It's a National Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator uh, project, which is really an interesting NSF um, program that brings together lots of different users and lots of different researchers in this convergent science. And so for us, we're hydrologists, ML experts, data scientists, software engineers, user experience, and educators. Two institutions are Arizona and Princeton, um, but you can see we have a whole host of partners and collaborators. Now, what we're doing is we're building a platform to generate these rigorous simulations from bedrock to the top of the treetops on demand. And you could think of this as the next step from what I just showed in HydroFrame. So HydroFrame, you click on a watershed and it automatically generates a Parflow CLM model of that watershed that you can run on demand. Hydrogen takes this one step further and combines state-of-the-art physics-based simulations using Parflow with machine learning approaches that are really efficient and rigorous and able to capture extremes, but are really able to now run anywhere. And I'll dive into that a little bit more in a second. So we're taking a really novel approach to machine learning and hydrology. And what's important about this is we're building emulator models on computational hydrology, hydrologic simulators. These ML models can be trained on situations that haven't happened yet, often called reinforcement learning. This is actually borrowed from the self-driving car um, approach where self-driving cars don't want to 
behave well in normal traffic situations. They want to behave well in accident situations. Accident situations are rare, just like our floods and our droughts are rare. But we want our models to be robust in those types of situations. Now, what's important is that our emulator models can be calibrated or using model-based inference more readily than our computational hydrologic models. So this gives them an additional advantage for combining the integrated hydrologic model connections and this data fusion. And as important, they're orders of magnitude less expensive to run. And so we can train an ML model and then provide this in a web form or in a, in a container for water managers that they can run not on a supercomputer. So I'm gonna give a quick example um, of some early work that we've done to sort of prototype the system. And this first work is done on what we call the tilted V catchment. This is a standard benchmark type problem in hydrology. So it's like a tilted book here, um, and it's been used in a lot of intercomparison benchmarks. But what we're doing is we're taking many realization of the systems that we're modeling by perturbing parameters that we're simulating with the integrated hydrologic model. We then feed the ML these distributed physical parameters, such as topographic slopes, Manning's roughness and precipitation. And then we train the emulator on the output from PAR flow, which in this case is surface pressure everywhere as a 2D or 3D field. And then we're calculating either the hydrograph or other processes at the output. So let's take a quick look at what our tilted V looks like. So it's not exactly reality, but it is realistic. So it's a very basic watershed, two hill slopes and a channel. It's been used, as I mentioned, extensively to represent a lot of different kinds of benchmark and physical behaviors. And so what happens when we compare, say, an ensemble of trained machine learning emulators on our um, on our power flow simulations. And I'm just showing, we can look at a lot of different statistics here, but I'm just showing our metrics in terms of uh, the generated hydrograph. Now remember that the machine learning emulator is actually trained over almost a thousand realizations of power flow. So a thousand realizations of power flow, but it's trained on the surface pressure. And then we're calculating the outflow in every case. We take a set of training simulations, and then we have a set of same statistics, but not the exact same realizations that we're using for our comparison. And that's what I'm showing here. So we noticed right off the bat, our blue curve is par flow. And then this is the spread of the different realizations. And then this is our par flow emulator, our machine learning trained on par flow. And so we can see that we get really good behavior in terms of our peak flow and a really good match across our ensemble distribution. And we get pretty good recession behavior. In fact, statistically speaking, our machine learning emulator is actually doing really well. So we can readily train our machine learning emulator on par flow and it produces results that are pretty much statistically just as good as par flow. Now what's important is what happens if instead of this set of training or validation realizations that are from our normal statistics, what happens if we take a set of ensemble members that are outside of the range that the machine learning emulator was trained on? So what happens now is the machine learning emulator blows up. It is really challenged to represent these out of range validation runs. So now we have the par flow runs here and we have the emulator here for two different cases. These are two different machine learning models. And what's important is that these are simulations that the machine learning emulator has not seen, nor has it seen anything statistically like them. And unfortunately or fortunately, what happens with these statistical techniques is that if they haven't seen these kinds, these sorts of scenarios, they don't behave well because they don't have a record to go on. They're only as good as what they've been sort of calibrated or fed or trained on. Now, what's important about this is I've talked a lot about this new normal, right? We're off the map. We have situations where our past historical observations 
don't represent our future behavior. So how are machine learning emulators going to be able to, to handle this? And, and what's our, our approach? Our, you know, how do we really surmount this problem? So I'm now going to talk about some preliminary results in our test case. And our upper Colorado domain is sort of our first. This is our first test case. Um, this is a large domain, as I mentioned, and talked a lot about its importance. Um, it's an important watershed. And we're leveraging a four decadal simulation that uh, postdoc um, Dr. Huang Tran in, in my group published in Groundwater in 2020, and then also has a review in uh, scientific data. And this allows us, this you know, big archive of simulations allow us to do a lot of different training simulations. Now, as I mentioned, um, the US Bureau of Rec is one of our partners and early adopters. And the US Bureau of Rec is an important partner for this because they're the largest wholesaler of water in the US. They provide one out of five Western farmers with irrigation water. They're the second largest producer of hydropower. They deliver 10 trillion gallons of water to more than 31 people. And they contribute about 63 billion in economic output and almost half a million jobs. Now, as a partner, they got to pick a demonstration or sort of our proof of concept watershed within the upper Colorado. And we picked the Taylor or they picked the Taylor. This is the upper Colorado here. The Taylor sits in the upper Gunnison. This is uh, what it looks like from, uh, from a commercial airline flight. And the Taylor watershed is this really, you know, high snowmelt dominated watershed that's really important for water as I mentioned in the upper Colorado, most of the water comes for Lake Mead, Lake Powell comes from these mountain headwater systems. And it's very important to the BOR. Now the work I'm showing, this is um, work that's uh, another postdoc in my group, Dr. Elena Leonarduzzi, who's a postdoc in HMEI. Um, and this is all of uh, Elena's work that I'm showing here. And what we're doing now is instead of working with the tilted V, we're doing a lot of different types of simulations where we're training our Taylor watershed, both machine learning emulators and um, comparing them to our PARflow integrated hydrologic model simulations. And so our preliminary results are really promising. Now we've swapped to soil moisture here. This is one of the important um, quantities that were quantities of interest. And what I'm showing is this is the end of summer soil moisture from our machine learning emulator for the Taylor compared with our power flow simulation. And what we see is that we get really good agreement. And we can look at a point um, in time. This is actually a point within the watershed that's at a observation location for soil moisture and snow. And we can see that we also get really good temporal behavior, right? So our machine learning emulator does it perfectly, but very robustly matches our power flow simulation. Now, what's important about this is that Parflow runs one year of the Taylor in about 22 minutes on our cluster. Pretty modest compute resources. The emulator runs one year in less than 20 seconds. And that's revolutionary now. So we can do things with the emulator that you would never be able to do with the integrated hydrologic model. We can also think about how we train the emulators for these new normal or no analog future. And this is some really recent work that Ellen has been working on. But what this is showing is that we can take an emulator here. These are just statistics over the Taylor watershed. This is um, root mean square. This is Nash Sutliff and, and Klin Gupta. And this is over time. So this is in the system. This is when snow is melting. And what we see is two different emulators trained on different kinds of information one emulator that's only trained on our historical simulations, and one emulator where we actually create additional new normal simulations with PARflow that never happened. With the integrated hydrologic model, we can create severe drought conditions. We can train the emulator on conditions that didn't exist. And we can look at what happens when we create a drought type scenario that the emulator hasn't seen, but it's been trained on drought-like scenarios. And now the emulator that's been trained on our drought-like scenarios actually does quite well. But our emulator that hasn't seen these drought scenarios, just like our tilted V case, it doesn't do so well. 
And so what this allows us to do is really simulate and fuse these two approaches to provide additional ability for our emulators to behave better when they're off the map of our historical observations. All right, so we envision a democratized community, water platform for the US in two different kind of formats, hydrogen and hydroframe. These large simulations that are easily accessible, platforms and portals to run simulations, customized machine learning emulators, and better water information um, for decision makers. So with that, I think we're gonna move to a, a extended question and answer period. I wanna thank everybody so much um, for your attention and for the ensuing discussion. And thanks HMEI for asking me to uh, give this seminar. And with this, I'll leave you uh, with a splash page um, for the Integrated Groundwater Modeling Center, as Mike mentioned, um, which is IGRMC at Princeton.edu. So thank you very much. And I think that we now move into the question and answer phase. Terrific. Thanks, Reed. Uh, that, that was great. Um, lots of interesting material. Um, so uh, my job now is to, is to give a very short uh, introduction to our discussant, uh, our good friend Emil Carre. Emil Carre Porporado is the Thomas J. Wu, class of 94, professor uh, jointly appointed in civil and environmental engineering and HMEI, uh, just like Reed. Um, as most of you uh, probably know, Emil Carre is a hydrologist whose work focuses on uh, various kinds of ecosystem processes in the broad field that we oftentimes refer to as eco-hydrology. Uh, Emil Carre has uh, done significant work and has sort of detailed interest in things like soil moisture, vegetation, and nutrient cycling, and the interactions among those uh, in, in sort of uh, water-limited uh, environments with a focus on soils. So anyway, uh, Emil Carre, I will turn it over to you, and uh, you and Reed uh, will jointly have the screen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. This uh... A nice introduction. Uh, Reed, thank you for the nice talk. Very, very stimulating, very interesting. Um, clearly a very important topic. No, we, uh, groundwater is not just water for us, but it's also, as you showed at the beginning, is food, is, is, so it's food security, it's interactions with climate. And yet it's probably the most unknown uh, part of the water cycle. It's certainly the least visible. And, uh, and, and that creates lots of challenges as you have, you have very nicely outlined. So th the first question just to get started and then I would like the audience to, uh, I, I'm going to read the, 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 the Q&A uh, as the questions come. So please uh, populate with your questions, but I'll start with my own question, which is simply, um, this was a very interesting talk focused on the US and the US has lots of data, of course, is, is the country that is that is uh, uh, that is our country here? But how representative is this of of the entire uh, global situation with groundwater? Is it that bad? Is it worse? And uh, when it comes also not just to water quantity but to water quality, uh, do we see something else? Do we see the same trends in research in policy? So that that's the way I would start the discussion. Yeah, that's a terrific question. So. Um, I think the answer is yes and no. So the U.S. is does have um, is is very data rich. I'll put it that way, and is probably one of the better uh, places to develop and understand these these types of approaches and these types of models. There are of course a lot of groups that have jumped straight global. Um, I've kind of always worked my way up um, in scale and in size and extent. But one of the hopes is that we develop these models where we are in, in more data rich areas so that we can have more confidence in applying them in more data poor areas. Um, in terms of other groups that are doing these large scale, continental scale hydrologic uh, model type simulations, Stefan Collette's group, Stefan is at the University of Bonn and, and the Research Center in Ulish. He is uh, running a, an EU Cortex model, which is over the EU, continental EU uh, domain. And then uh, Jean-Michel Jean -Michel Cohard's group and the University of the Alps, Grenoble. Um, 
his group is actually running a Kanwa or continental West African domain. And so, you know, the Kanwa domain is definitely more important. Uh, West Africa has water challenges as well. They have not turned to groundwater quite um, as readily, but they undoubtedly will. And so understanding and being able to help predict water situation um, there is important. Um, one of the hopes is that with integrated models, they're much more complicated and, and um, expensive simulations of the system, but that they have better fidelity in these areas that are more data poor. But you know, that's one of the things that's an open challenge. Mm -hmm. What about the, the quality? Uh, water quality like so for yeah example, so water so, uh, salinization of the groundwater sure no so water quality is really important and um i actually started out early in my career uh doing contaminant transport and water quality almost exclusively mm. and um we're not there yet with water quality in these large-scale you know kind of integrated systems but we're close and you know we're doing a lot of particle tracking for residence time and age and that's getting us to being able to simulate water quality changes at large scale. Uh, we also have some geochemical reactive transport capability within PARFLOW that we can couple into the land service model. Other groups are doing this as well. And one of the reasons that I, I developed these large scale models that are PDE based, that are locally mass conservative, is to be able to understand transport and water quality a little bit better. But I think that water quality is undoubtedly really important, but it's, it's something that I think we're working towards Thank you, Reed. Thank you. Uh, I have other questions, but I see uh, interesting questions in the Q&A. So actually, I'm going to, uh, uh, there is a question by Nadid, who, uh, it's very interesting, these questions, how this machine learning, uh, have you explored physics in for machine learning? How can you inject physics? Sure. Into yes. To help? So basically, yes. So we have uh, explored this quite a lot. And I should mention, you know, Laura Condon, um, and and Peter Melkar at, at, at Princeton and in uh, astrophysics and, and CSML have been close collaborators on all this work. And we're using really more physics simulators. So we're running the physics-based simulation many, many times, and we're training ML approaches on those models. The, as I understand it, sort of the physics informed is in your penalty function or in a regularization function, you actually include something that is more like um, the, you know, either the function evaluation that we use in our in our nonlinear approaches um, or, a, you know, a physics constraint. And you can go all the way to having the ML be basically like a simulator. So instead of, you know, we formulate the function, um, I mean, we do a function evaluation, then we send that off to a linear solver. Um, you could send that off to an ML-based linear solver all the way to just having the ML train on the model. And so we're more on the emulator side of that equation, but we're in this project, um, particularly if, we, if we're lucky enough to go to phase two, we're going to explore more of the emulator-based type approaches. But that's a great, um, great question and great clarification. Thanks. Yes, no, that, that, I thought it was a great question. Thank you, and thanks for the answer. I think physics and and uh, machines together do, do a very good job when they can talk, communicate. Um, the next two questions are kind of together, I think. And they, they have, so we have a question from Rios from Kyoto University and one from Dan. And they, they're interested and they're curious about how the local communities can contribute to this platform. And, uh, and Dan is actually going beyond that and saying, okay, is this tool for, for groups like NGOs from, uh, for for private uh, entities or also for the uh, from for for the policymakers for for institutions and how do you get their sure them? yeah no sure that's those are terrific questions thanks so much um, from all over the world uh, so what we're what we're doing in in hydrogen um, is and I can talk about hydroframe and hydrogen sort of broadly because these are both open platforms um, that, you know, when we're out of the beta phase in, in HydroFrame, you know, we're partnering with COASI, um, Consortium for the University of Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences Incorporated, and um, with a, a sister project called HydroShare, which is Dave Tarbotten's project, which is about, it, it's really about sharing data sets and, and models in, in hydrology. And so then we'll have a, a basically 
open membership. So you apply, there's no fee, you can, you know, sign up for our system. And we have limits on resources, but it's it's basically an open system and an open portal. Now, Hydrogen is a little bit different because we have, um, we're populating an external advisory board that will help us craft the platform because Hydrogen, we're not taking every variable that Parflow CLM outputs, we're taking select ones that we're using for training and eventually we move to a national framework, but we're taking these pilot studies, Upper Colorado, probably Delaware is gonna be the next one. And we want our advisory board to be part of that and then be our early kind of user test case. Now our partners are the US Bureau of Reclamation. Reclamation. And what's nice about that configuration is that the Bureau of Rec has all the way from the Technical Services Center. So we have collaborators um, that are in the TSC that are PhD hydrologists that are very used to large scale models, um, high performance computing, but they interface the sort of in-house R&D for hydrologists who are actually making decisions and, and dam operations. So releasing water from dams, making these decisions. And that's a nice spectrum because we can you know, really use that pipeline to help develop things that the dam operators find useful. Now, they may not be large scale hydrologic modelers, but they are hydrologists who know their system with a tremendous amount of experience and their standards are very high. So it's not like we're just going to be able to roll in and say, oh, here's our you know, model. It's fantastic. It's going to solve all your problems. We're really, you know, it's going to be a very rigorous process to show that it's useful to them and in, in, in these um, scenario type simulations. Now, beyond that, it's really open. So we have the USGS, um, we have uh, some water districts, we have, you know, a whole suite of um, entities, some water agencies that we're using to populate our board, um, including some NGOs that we're trying to, you know, get a good cross sampling. Um, if people are interested in participating, um, you know, you can reach out to email me, you can also um, email Dr. Laura Condon at Arizona and, you know, kind of, we can um, definitely, as we move forward, you know, one of the first things that we're going to do is have a, a user walk workshop and some other kind of user driven type design process. Um, and we'd, you know, love to have participants in this. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. <clears throat> uh, Kirsten Findel, uh, she's thanking you for the nice talk. And she's also mentioning that there is a similar uh, effort called the digital earth for for the cli for climate data similar similar to the one you're presenting for groundwater and uh, they would benefit from learning from what you have done and uh, perhaps you can be in, con in touch with with Kristen. yes and um and i didn't mention this in the slides explicitly but a big important part of the um the princeton hydro data center is that you know we're keeping our data um, you know, and, and certain kinds of data, but then we're also building these interfaces to a lot of other external sources of data. So if you look at uh, Streamflow is mostly USGS, groundwater is mostly USGS. So APIs to the USGS systems are really easy to, you know, relatively speaking, easy to develop. But if you look at soil moisture um, or eddy flux towers or things like this, that becomes really complicated because soil moisture is across you know, several different agencies. And so we're building these APIs as part of our project so that we interface um, with the community. And likewise, we're providing inter APIs to the community so that we're not, you know, we're not, we're, we're a member, we're a collaborator of this community. And so um, Kirsten, it would be great to have you reach out and we can talk about ways to collaborate um, in both directions. That was really terrific. Thanks for the comment. Then we have Maria Fleury one of our students in CE. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you envision water managers could do, could, how could they could use the hydroframe uh, frame and hydrogen platforms? And uh, uh, you, you have already mentioned that, but uh, I really would like you to elaborate more and tell us, even in the future, how this could be useful to really, I think we are worried about groundwater depletion. And so knowing more, uh, it, it's certainly the first step to care more. Sure. Yeah, no, Maria, that's a terrific uh, question. Thanks so much for the question. And um, I'll give you just kind of a concrete example of our first use case. Um, and this is the Bureau of Rex use case, but it's a it's a pretty common one. 
So what we're doing are six month seasonal simulations that start on April 1st, because April 1st in the Rockies is the important snowpack date, whether or not that's peak snowpack, that is the historical date that is used to project forward to see how dry the summer is going to be. And so our ML emulator models can be used not to provide just a single prediction, but a suite of probabilistic predictions where the user can say, okay, what if we have the observed snowpack on April 1st and we're predicting forward? What if we have a historically dry summer, you know, pick one from the record? Or what if we have no monsoon? Or what if we have, um, you know, a, a dry summer that hasn't occurred? So a half degree center Celsius warmer. And these simulations can be run on demand in sort of this exploratory way. And then they provide heat maps of water table depth, soil moisture, um, which is plant water stress, which is important for fire managers who are planning for the fire season, um, and inflows into the reservoir. And so all of these can be combined to understand and better inform these decision-making processes. Now, this is just the first use case. There's a lot of other ways that we could use this. It doesn't have to be six months. It could be you know, 50 years and sort of these long-term climate projections. It could be water use scenarios. could be lots of different ways, but that's just kind of a you know, what we're building for our first um, phase one prototype application. Thank you, Rick. I like the question of Spencer here that uh, is asking you um, to, to continue refi uh, refining and, and improving hydrogen and these efforts. What are the key resources that, that you would like to have that you don't have yet? And especially if you think outside academia, what would really help you? Sure, yes, yeah. so, so what's important um, with this platform is that we are trying to build something that is um, open and accessible to the nonprofit, government, academic type communities. But um, we can't really do that for the consulting communities. The consulting communities can't run on, on public hardware and things like that. So we're partnering with AWS, Amazon Web Services, for providing ways for consultants to run in kind of a fee-for-service. And then we're hoping to partner um, with additional foundations, um, particularly private nonprofit foundations, to help with providing a sustained platform for the public users. It becomes a sort of challenging uh, balance because we want to provide this public access. We want to provide NGOs, government agencies with this free platform that that really costs them nothing. Um, and, you know, while balancing the needs of industry in this. And so in addition to having input from our board and having additional, you know, kind of voices to help guide the process um, in what we're sort of dubbing phase three, which would be after NSF funding, um, NSF funding uh, ends, we would be looking for other sources of sustained funding for, for this model. So, you know, that's one of the answers. There's a, you know, a whole other, a lot of other ways that we could refine hydrogen, but, you know, it's a terrific question. Thanks, Spencer, for them. Thank you, Uri. Um, sure. A question regarding uh, uh, interstate boundaries, interstate or, or international boundaries. Uh, physics and, and uh, climate don't, of course, don't stop there, but uh, many times data do, um, and collaborations are also. Um, what are the barriers? What are the constraints that you see in this case? Yeah, no, that's a terrific question. And so we are, um, we're not modeling the decision at this point, although that is one of Peter's strong interests and that is actually one of the BOR's interests. So I think in out years, we will be looking at modeling the human decision, modeling that piece with, with ML approaches. Um, but to the second part of your question, there's actually a lot of really crazy uh, political boundaries that show up in the data sets, uh, subsurface being one of them. Um, state geologic boundaries show up all the time. And, you know, one state geologic um, agency will read the geology slightly different than another or categorize the geology slightly different. And then as you cross um, international boundaries and, you know, the Columbia is the, one of the easier ones, um, a large portion of the Columbia reaches up into Canada and needs to be included in our continental scale models. Um, and once you jump across 
international boundaries, you have different data sets, different data rules. And so these, these problems um, occur, you know, kind of, kind of throughout the process. And we're constantly, um, you know, on the data side, we have a, a whole team, a PhD student in my group and three postdocs, two in my group and one in um, at the University of Arizona that are doing nothing but kind of harmonizing these data sets and putting together these data sets, documenting these data sets, because once you cross international or state boundaries, you have you know multiple data sets that you're stitching together and you need to make sure that this is all done properly. And so it's, it's not super exciting, but it's a really important, um, very important part of the whole process. Thank you, Reid. Um, okay, Saverio, there was a question by Saverio, but it's, it's kind of cut on oh, There is a new piece here. Very interesting talk by Saverio. Uh, I was wondering, uh, how can you capture the human induced changing in groundwater recharge? I'm thinking especially about changing in crop and soil degradation. This, uh, this may create tipping points and uh, the training data may not have information about that. And I think you touched about uh, extremes or, or scenarios yeah. that are not included, but especially with these tipping points, I think it's really crucial. Yes, for sure. And that's a really great, um, really great question, really important. So, uh, Milkray, as you mentioned, these, you know, we can run simulations with a, with the integrated hydrologic model that, that didn't exist. And then we can train the MLs on those. But in terms of how we construct those simulations, um, they're also challenging and a lot of work. And so I had a master's student um, who published a paper uh, really looking at trying to come up with um, some attribution for the Dust Bowl. Uh, so she built a kind of most of the High Plains aquifer um, watershed type model. And then she perturbed the system with a increase in temperature, decrease in precipitation, and change in land cover. And there's been a lot of speculation that change in land cover was one of the big contributors uh, to the severity of the dust bowl. Sort of this water will, you know, follow the plow. That if you that if you cultivate agriculture, that this water following the plow will, you know, will will create the rain. Of course, it didn't because um, water doesn't follow the plow. And so, you know, we were able to construct different model simulations for these different scenarios. We didn't really do soil degradation per se, but we did do land cover changes and we're able to sort of balance the impacts, the relative impacts of, you know, kind of hot drought versus wet drought, if you will, um, versus these land cover changes. And, and land cover changes are an important aspect of this um, that are important to study. So really terrific question. Thanks so much for the, for the question. Thank you, Reed. Uh, there is, and probably this is, the last one we can we can afford taking, but there is a question from Jim Waldman, our friend, that uh, the director of the Watershed Institute. First of all, welcome to Princeton Reed. The Watershed Institute is looking forward to working with you. So, as you know, uh, then the, here is the Super question. Nice, as, you yeah. know, yes. as you know, the human causes um, changes to hydrology that are of most concern in the east are the ones that are connected to increasing stormwater runoff and flooding. How do your models apply to this concern? Yes, that's a terrific question. Thanks, Jim. And so that is kind of the classic East Coast is usually too much water. West Coast is usually not enough water. Um, we have actually done quite a bit of work in urban settings. Um, integrated hydrologic models are very good for um, urban groundwater studies. And so in collaboration with Claire Welty's group um, at the University of, Baltimore, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, and her urban center, Claire has done a lot of work, uh, particularly using PARFLOW and these types of approaches on urban groundwater, particularly in the Baltimore region. Um, and then I've had other PhD students who have looked at uh, best management practices, green infrastructure, and use of green infrastructure kind of more holistically um, using integrated hydrologic models in a whole broad range of different kinds of settings. And so that is a that is an important use um, and, and you know, I didn't really talk, I mostly focused this on the dry side of the extreme events, but we're also focusing on the wet side of extreme events um, in this project as well. So really terrific question, Jim. Thanks. And thanks for the saying hi and for the welcome to Princeton. Terrific. Uh, I think it's time for me to step in, um, uh, just being uh, uh, careful with the clock here. Uh, and uh, it's time for us to end this, but I want to thank uh, Reed for a terrific 
presentation. Emil Carre, great job uh, uh, dealing with questions and all of the audience who sent in the questions and who participated. Um, I'll remind you that this was, uh, as you see on the screen, uh, the last of our uh, uh, seminars for this spring semester. Uh, we all look forward to seeing you back here in the fall. Um, uh, you will soon see information about the fall schedule, but our first uh, meeting and our first seminar will be then in September 2021. We hope that uh, that will at least uh, have some component that's in person while we continue to offer these uh, remote connections as well, so we can connect to those of you who, who are not in Princeton and, and may not be able to attend in person. Uh, with that, I wish all of you a very good uh, summer. Uh, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you back here again in the fall. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.